okay uh, i think we shall start now majority of participants are there okay sir please start okay thank you very much uh, to shima uh, let me put my powerpoint on the screen and let me share the screen first Oh, you have disabled the screen. Can you allow me to share the screen? Uh, sure, it's done. Okay. Can you see the PowerPoint now? Yes, very good. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me thank Tilotoma Foundation. for organizing this conference on insights on environmental conservation i consider environmental degradation as one of the most serious challenges of this century which has the capability to actually endanger the entire human civilization for i congratulate you and i congratulate you all Uh, your colleagues who are engaged in doing this wonderful work and to tushima datta who is the moderator of this session i would also like to convey my best wishes to all other participants who are going to address this conference uh, during the course of this afternoon session so i would like to begin with uh, my presentation now first of all let us understand Hello. what is environment yeah i'm i'm able to join now okay i joined i was able to join okay can uh, you put He... your microphone off so that okay all right all right so what is environment that is one of the things how to define environment actually there is no better definition of environment than we call in sanskrit panch mahabhut that the five great elements of nature they constitute the environment that is the space we call it akash air then energy or fire water and earth earth with all its geological features and millions of life now that is the environment surrounding us uh, which is uh, actually the source of our survival whatever we eat or drink air we breathe the water we drink the food we eat the clothing we wear the habitation we live in the energy we consume and everything else we use in our life comes from this very environment this environment sustains and nurtures our life and that is why it is our home i call it our home now humans had perfect harmony with environment for thousands of years uh, there were no problem uh, in in the past but this industrial revolution in the middle of the 18th century started impacting on all that the two important things happened industrial revolution which gave birth to a lot of machines and mechanized system of production and secondly the theory of adam smith which is his book known as wealth of nations where he defined that wealth of nation is the goods and services produced in a country not the human beings not any other beings only the goods and services so with that there was a new competition which started to have machine produced items and exploitation of natural resources now exploitation of nature the nature which sustains our life we started exploiting that nature how ironical it is then with that came mass production what we call assembly line production massive urbanization 
and emergence of a consumer society. Uh, till the COVID problem started, uh, we saw the peak of the consumer society going up and up, the, the global GDP increasing every single day. The technology and globalization, they also added to this process. Now you can see how much we are destroying the environment. 60 billion tons of minerals are extracted, net minerals. If you take the gross, it is more than 100 billion tons per year. Can you imagine that is the kind of damage we are doing? We are producing all kinds of products. The shopping malls are filled with all that. And what we are, we are in a race for higher GDP every day, higher per capita income, higher gross domestic product. These are our aim everywhere, anywhere in the world. All global leaders are doing this. And as a result, we are now challenging the carrying capacity of the earth. The earth cannot carry this anymore. And I think the recent pandemic of COVID has shown it that nature has its own method of containing it. Now consumption and environment, if you look at the gross domestic product of the world, in 1950, it was 5.31 trillion US dollars. With the same amount of US dollars or the same value of US dollar, uh, it is today approximately 86 trillion US dollars, which on PPP basis works out about 128 trillion US dollars. It has gone up 25 times. And the natural resources are being exploited in a big way. We can feel in our own life how much we used to use in childhood and how much we are using now. I can say for myself that I'm at least using 20 times than what I used to use from nature in my childhood. So things have changed tremendously. This has led to tremendous deforestation, loss of biodiversity. The wildlife population has declined by almost 50% since 1970. I'm talking about from 70. So all these, and now we will come to the specifics in subsequent slides. The environmental degradation is, can be divided into six parts. Water contamination, contamination and acidification of oceans, ecosystem loss, air pollution, and global warming. These are the major areas where we are having serious problems. Minimum 35% of agricultural soil has been degraded due to erosion, salinization, use of chemical fertilizers, desertification, and all that. I have done some articles on that separately, but we have lost minimum one third of total productive soil in the world. And you know how much time to, it takes to make soil. It takes a few hundred years to have uh, the fertile soil in, you know, in place. The face water consumption has gone up nine times since 1950. The per capita availability has gone down considerably. It's expected to be around uh, even less than 5,000 cubic meters in, in, in these years, which is not enough. Uh, and it will not be enough in the coming years. Water bodies are sinking, they are getting contaminated. We can see industrial effluent. Can you imagine 330 cubic meters of, uh, cubic kilometers of water going into the municipal sewage all around, 1.7 billion tons of solid waste generated every year. I can give you emptying examples of things. In the ocean, there are 13,000 uh, plastic pieces every square kilometer of uh, ocean surface. Uh, that is the kind of environment we have created in the last 50 years, particularly since 19, or last 70 years, particularly since 1950. Now, 92% of global population lives in areas where the quality of air index is not healthy. Now, the, the greenhouse gas emissions are hitting a record level. You will see some graphs later on. We are even you know, despite so many treaties and conventions and conferences, 
the the amount of uh, ghg emission is going up every single day uh, it, it's a very very sad state then air contamination is increasing about 7 to 8 million people are dying every year may only because of air contamination we have seen in india how uh, bad the air contamination goes in the months of november december january these are just some pictures to give you this is a picture of india where we have uh, you can see air contamination in the month of november december this is also picture in our own country how water contamination is taking place and this is the erosion of soil which is happening we can see the desertification of soil and salinity all this uh, you can see in these pictures now uh, in terms of human health the heart diseases asthmatic uh, diseases strokes respiratory all these uh, diseases are increasing in quantum jumps there are uh, coronal research people saying that 40% of the total that in deaths in the world are caused due to air water and soil pollution today and most of the human illnesses uh, are because of water pollution and okay. poor quality of air so this is very sad state uh, in terms of human health as well now you can see this graph that after 19 1950 the amount of ghg emission has climbed up in a very very sharp you know way you can see this you can have statistics available everywhere in the world and then you see this is the global trend of the ghg emission particularly after 1970 the emissions are going up this is 49 gigatons every year uh, and this is only 2010 figure if we go to 2020 figure you will find it at least 55 gigatons so this is going up tremendously then you see this tremendous evidence of global warming everywhere the ice sheets everywhere in the world are going down greenland antarctica you know the glaciers they are melting everywhere because of the uh, global warming last each of the last three decades have been warmer and warmer in the on the earth and if you look at the temperatures you will see a chart subsequently that in the current century all the years have been warmer than any time in the past so all this uh, these evidences are available to us we can see the uh, global sea level is rising it's about 8 inches in the last century which means lot of islands are already drowning some will drown in the in the coming years and decades then the earth's average surface temperature has risen the greenland arctic and an arctic ice sheets have decreased in mass quantity you will uh, you can ask scientists they will tell you how much decline these ice sheets have experienced particularly in the last 20 30 years now i don't want to go into too many uh, details of this nature but uh, let me tell you that there is a ipcc which is intergovernmental panel on climate change this is a scientific body of the united nations which does study on all the climate related issues all the global warming issues and all the contamination issues they periodically issue a report the last report was issued in 2015 the new report will be issued in 2022 next one and that report has given tremendous amount of data proving that how much global warming has taken place and how it's affecting in every side of human life so this is uh, uh, i this report if you have a look at just a cursory look you will realize that how dangerous the path we are treading right now this is the 10 hottest year in this current century in fact 2017 was the hottest this was this graph is little older so this is up to 2016 2017 was even hotter 
2018 and 2019 are also hot, but not the hottest. You can see these uh, ice sheets and the glaciers, they are melting like this. This is the graph of the air pollution, global air pollution. Most of the cities where we live, they have very high concentration of, uh, you know, uh, what you call uh, particles per million, you know, ppm, what they call it. And those particles means the, the, the air is very dangerous for our living. The quality of air quality index is very, very poor. This is the air quality index as per WHO. And most of the people today live in this category of heavy pollu heavily polluted, 201 to 300. In India, we live in severely polluted atmosphere. This is even worse than that. So let me come now, what is the cause of all this? I have put them into seven siege. Seven siege is one of the capitalism. Capitalism is not bad in effect, but it provides an atmosphere where you can exploit things for what you call consumer society. So it provides the capital, it provides the atmosphere. Then we have a corporate culture. Now corporate is a, what we call an identity which does not exist, which is impersonal identity. It's only on the paper. And they have no concern because human being has some concern, but corporations have no concern. Their concern is only profit and you know providing returns to the shareholder and having their own growth. And therefore they don't care what happens to the climate and nature. Conquest of nature is the next item on agenda of the global agenda. Uh, every country is trying to conquest the nature that we will change this, we will do this. Uh, and we try to exploit the nature in every form. Uh, of course, they are failing and they will fail miserably, but that's what they are doing right now. And consumption and consumption, because without more consumption, you can't have more GDP, that's impossible. More GNP, more GDP, more per capita income emanates from more consumption, higher consumption. And therefore, the consumption is becoming the key slogan for all the corporates, all the capitalist society, all the leaders of the globe. And consumption means you have to exploit nature more, you have to contaminate more. Everything which comes has to be produced in factories. First, you refine the raw material, you contaminate. Then the raw mat refined raw material are used for producing certain products. Then you contaminate. So you contaminate air, you contaminate water, and you contaminate soil. All the elements of the nature we are contaminating. And then the climate change is happening and we are inviting calamities ourselves. Now, what do the experts say? You know, the current uh, Secretary General of UN uh, has said that realities about climate change are worse than expected, eh? worse than expected and with very severe consequences. Sir Dave, David Attenborough, who is known for his concern for environment, he says that human civilization may collapse if urgent action is not taken uh, to curb the climate change. This is what he has said. And you can see some economist, Joseph Stilgitz, he's a very well-known economist. Uh, he says that climate crisis is our third world war. It needs bold response like Green New Deal. That's what he says. So this is the warning, which is very clear, which is writing on the wall in front of us. And we have to address this issue everywhere. Now, that was the dark side. Now, let's, let's see also the better side, the, the, the positive side of, uh, uh, of this problem. Now, of course, there is a greater awareness about climate. There are a lot of what you call uh, networking all over the world. We have this Earth Day network. We have a lot of campaign for renewable energy, solar energy, wind energy, nuclear energy. Then there are plastic free groups. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to get rid of plastic items, particularly single use plastic. Then there are green lobbies. They want to put, uh, you know, uh, stop to the, what we call uh, denudation of forests. They want to put new plants uh, all around, increase the, uh, you know, green areas wherever possible. Then water lobbies, which want to contain the contamination of rivers, of the lakes. 
वाइल्ड लाइफ लो बीच प्रोसेसिंग एंड रीयूज ऑफ वेस्ट विच इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज वी हैव माउंटेन्स ऑफ वेस्ट इन इन मेनी मेनी सिटीज एंड इन इंडिया वी कैन सी वेस्ट ऑल अराउंड इन ऑल द सिटीज इन इवन ऑन द रोड्स एवरीवेयर देन पब्लिक ट्रांसपोर्ट एक्सपेंस इज इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज दैट्स द ओनली वे यू कैन रिड्यूस नंबर ऑफ व्हीकल्स ऑन द रोड and uh, in fact this system of sharing economy uh, is also helping in that where one car can be used by many like uber ola system was also fairly good in that sense the number of cars on the roads come down at least uh, in a some quantity then of documentary on bbc and netflix uh, where they have given very alarming picture of our planet and what can happen so these are the positive side people are understanding this problem there is a global awareness there are global lobbies the governments are acting the international efforts are on uh, i have not put here the international efforts because we know since the global what we call earth summit in rio de janeiro in 1992 uh, many many summits have taken place the last being uh, uh, what you call the 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 rio plus 20 and there was also the millennium summit before that then there was uh, what you call 2015 there was a summit what we call uh, uh, climate action summit at un now all these summits have taken place uh, global awareness is there but on the ground situation has not changed much of course there are some actions which have been taken now treaty of paris has been ratified by 186 countries uh, climate action summit in un 2019 which was another successful event just before the covid thing came up then there are nationally determined contributions and targets which have been specified for most countries and so many countries are taking action on that i can see nordic countries are the most active and they are developing renewable energies they are using bicycles and they are making plastic free their own countries and they are creating architecture which is environmentally friendly in india also there is awareness now we are having plantation of trees the solar alliance the prime minister modi recently inaugurated a solar plant which is supposed to be one of the largest in the world and then we have some water saving water harvesting equipment china is also doing in some steps in this direction and european union and us uh, us is you know coming out of the paris treaty which is very unfortunate but i'm sure uh, maybe after the election they will rejoin and they will not actually come out so these international efforts are working in a limited way but they will not work in a great way the what is the essence of life a sense of life is moderation in sanskrit we say ati sarvatra varjate excess is always prohibited and that is what buddha also said the middle path of buddha if we do not want to see extreme poverty in the country but at the same time if you have uh, trillions uh, the people a few people having trillions of dollars uh, you know there are about 2050 uh, billionaires in dollar terms in the world today in india which is a comparatively poor country we have more than 100 billionaires in dollar terms 119 i suppose now so that concentration of wealth on the one hand poverty on the other hand is not sustainable if we want sustainability we have to have moderation we have to have what we call in economics the distributive justice and that is what is needed we have to curb our greed uh, greed is the cause of all the problems uh, you know given the constant of time i won't be able to go more into these areas but uh, mahatma gandhi said once that uh, there is enough for everybody's need but not enough for everybody's greed and that is where we problem is the desires are infinite they keep expanding in a geometric progression one satisfied desire gives rise to four more desires and four gives rise to 16 more and that is a, an area which is completely 
uh, unreachable. In Mahabharata, there is a uh, sloka which, which uh, tells you that if you control the entire earth, you are the king of the earth and you your age is not increasing. You are not advancing in age. You have stabilized your age. Even then you will not be happy because then you will like to conquer some other planets and that's what we are doing. So the, the human greed is infinite. We have to understand that tendency and we have to, by understanding that, we have to teach it to everybody that this material desires will keep increasing. We have to learn what our ancestors told us to live with less. Those who can live with less, they are and they are what we call enlightened. With more anybody can live, but those who can live with less, they are really an enlightened people. And this is what uh, uh, what we call Isa Vasya Upanishad said. Isa Vasya Midam Sarvam Yatin Chai Jagatyam Jagat. Ten takten bunjita magrat kasya sovidanam. That this entire universe is pervaded by the Almighty or you know whatever the force you call it. And you should use only as much as you need. Not don't become greedy, don't become attached to things, because none of this belongs to you. And therefore, you should draw only as much you need, not more. And that should be the lesson. And I would like to end my presentation with this story. In a village, there used to be a, a, a hen uh, with, a, with a family. The hen used to give one golden or gold egg every day. The family was very happy. They used to sell the egg and lived happily. One day, the family went to a big city and they saw big jewelry shops and big palaces and, you know, a uh, lot of shopping malls and the wife got tempted. She came back home and she told her husband that, you know, why don't we buy those, those kinds of things? We buy some jewelry, we buy big palace with this. So how can we do that? They were discussing this at home. So the wife suggested, listen, we are getting one egg every day from the hand. Why don't we, you know, cut it and take out all the eggs at the same time so that we can do all that. And you know the result, what happened? They did that. And even that one egg, which was coming uh, one day, every day, stopped coming. And that is what we are doing to the Mother Earth today. We want to take out everything for us. We don't want to leave anything for the future. And what will happen? The, we are going to endanger the lives of our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. And therefore, it is time that we understand that growth of GDP is not an answer. It cannot be infinite. We have to stop more and more consumptions. We have to learn with learn to live with less. That is what I would like to say. If we want to really care for environment, we should live in harmony with the environment because environment is sustaining us. It is nurturing us. It is the source of our life. Thank you very much for giving me this chance to make this presentation and uh, I wish we can follow some of these, uh, you know, lessons which are enshrined in our ancient wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful presentation. So now Yukta will be given an introductory speech now. Greetings to all the distinguished panelists, guests, colleagues, and friends. I'm glad to welcome you all to the international session titled Insights on Environmental Conservation. I'm Yukta Acharya, Executive Kritilutama Foundation. This is an extremely relevant and crucial topic of discussion. Climate change and environmental conservation must be top global priorities for world leaders and policymakers. We received a huge response to this international session. In this session, we will discuss specific scientific or technical issues related to environmental conservation in different countries, as well as focus on broader concerns. 
we all need to endeavor to protect our planet and make it sustainable. Our distinguished panelists for today are Ambassador Gauri Shankar Gupta, former Indian ambassador to Mongolia, Hungary and Bosnia and Herzegovina and for former High Commissioner of India to Trinidad and Tobago, Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada and Montserrat. Former, he was also the former Indian Deputy Permanent Representative to UNESCO. Dr. Agum Damar Shakti, Director or to Raja Ali Haji Maritime University at Indonesia. Dr. Niranjan Kumar, Scientist and Joint Director, Central Silk Board for the Government of India. Professor Mahalaya, Ch Mahalaya Chatterjee, Professor of Urban Development and Regional Economics and former Director for the Center of Urban Economic Studies at the University of Calcutta. Dr. Arijit Chatterjee, Faculty of Environmental Science at Ashutosh College, for the, at Ashutosh College, University of Calcutta, associated with West Bengal Biodiversity Board. The moderator for today's panel would be Ms. Tushima Datta, Research Associate, uh, Tilotama Foundation. Dr. Madan Yadav, Research Adjunct, Tilotama Foundation, will act as the discussant during the interactive part of this discussion. I thank each of them for joining us by taking time out of their busy schedule. This session has been conceived by Ms. Tushima Datta, Research Associate for Tilotama Foundation, and Mr. Soham Das, Director to the Tilotama Foundation. I welcome the audience members to engage actively through the comment section. We will also try to accommodate some questions at the end during the interactive phase. I request Ms. Tushima to take over the proceedings. Thank you so much, Yukta. So our next speaker will be Dr. Agung Dhyamang Sapti, Rector, RH Maritime University, Uni Indonesia. Sir, Dr. Okay. Sapti, yeah. Uh, Please thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jita. Everybody, uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to share my screen. You get what the uh, screen, yeah. It's okay. Everybody can see the the my presentation. Hello. Yes, Hello. it can be seen. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, sir, it is seen. Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to thanks. It's my honor for me. Uh, to be invited uh, by uh, Tilotoma Foundation. Uh, it's my honor, of course, and also for our university. In fact, uh, Raja Ali Haji Maritime University is a new public university in Indonesia, it's, uh, which is located in the center of the Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian, I mean, uh, near from the Singapore. But it's very uh, newly university, so we are is uh, currently uh, developing university in Indonesia, and this opportunity for us is about uh, is a uh, uh, great opportunity for us to disseminate what we have done and also to get a uh, good networking with the colleague from the India. Well, my uh, speech is uh, with the. Coastal ecosystem monitoring. And I will show you some uh, case study from the Riau Island, Indonesia. Riau Island is the province where the Raja Ali Haji Maritime University is located. Uh, so I will show you later uh, about the ecosystem monitoring in this area. Uh, to begin with my presentation, I would like first to show you the general profile of Indonesia in the world system. Of course, Indonesia uh, uh, can attribute to the socio-economic uh, uh, country, uh, considered as the developing country. Indonesia also uh, um, a, 
great market area for uh, many countries in the world. And we are also the producer of raw material uh, from the many uh, natural resources. Uh, uh, we are also foreign debt department and also technology import and etc. Cetera, et cetera. And also, uh, when we talk about the attribution of natural resources and, and the environment, Indonesia is the one of the 17 mega biodiversity in the world. Uh, and we are also uh, considered as an archaeologic state because Indonesia is constituted by at least 17,500 islands. Uh, and uh, one of the province we call Rio Island province, uh, we have 2,408 islands. So this is a very strategic location. And uh, uh, this is Indonesia in the general profile. Indonesia position uh, uh, in several international environmental issues. First, I said that uh, mega biodiversity. Uh, in fact, Indonesia uh, is uh, only uh, is part of the 1.3 percent of the uh, world terrestrial land. But Indonesia, oh, 17% oh, of the world's total coral reef area. And we have also 10% of the flora species, 12% of the mammal species, 60% of reptile, flow species, 25% uh, of the fish species, etc. etc. And Indonesia uh, also has uh, reached with the uh, 100 ethnic. With 17 language and dialect so it's very uh, mega biodiversity and of course uh, indonesia also is the uh, one of the petroleum producer even now we are in deficit in terms of the uh, oil uh, oil uh, oil needs yeah uh, actually our production is only about 900 uh, thousand barrel per day but our uh, uh, need is uh, still 1.4 million barrel per day. So now we are in deficit not uh, in, in terms of the energy. And we uh, are also uh, uh, involved in the group 77 uh, for the trade. Uh, you know, uh, we have the global issue like the global warming, ozone layer, deflation, acid rain, uh, and also pollution. But Indonesia also has uh, such a problem. Uh, for example, we have the forest fire and also the offshore oil pollution, exploration of the forest resources, and also the land use uh, um, explore, exploitation. And uh, uh, we have also general local issues, for example, in some area, in some uh, moonstone will be drought, but in another area uh, that will be can, uh, flooding. Uh, uh, recently, we have also the landslide and, uh, and many other problems uh, in the lo local area, coastal erosion, seawater intrusion. For example, in Jakarta, capital of Indonesia, the seawater intrusion is already go for uh, 15 kilometers from the uh, coastal and also uh, the change in the function of the land. And uh, in Rio Island itself, we have, of course, have uh, uh, facing uh, many problems. Uh, the first is the exploitation of the land resources for the bauxite mining, because uh, uh, as I mentioned before, Rio Island province consists by the 2,408 island, and uh, all is considered as the small island because according to our law, the small island is the island with the size less than 2,000 kilometers square. Uh, and all the 2,400 island is uh, below that, uh, this uh, size. And in this, uh, I, in, in this island, uh, uh, many of them are uh, exploited for the bauxite mining. So. Uh, the problem, the remaining problem is because there is no uh, reclamation and there is no 
post harvest uh, post mining activity so uh, the uh, erosion uh, is the one of the main problem for our uh, ecosystem uh, the second problem is uh, because uh, uh, Rio Island is uh, new from the Malacca Street and also from the uh, South China Sea there is a uh, many maritime traffic uh, go from this area and one of the uh, potential problem is the oil spill in our coastal area uh, another problem also in this uh, Rio island province about the uh, mangrove exploitation exploitation uh, because uh, the mangrove is uh, can be used for the uh, coal use and also for any uh, food policies and we have also some problem related with the destructive fishing. So uh, people uh, try to get the fish by using the explosive and that can make another destruction for the, leaf, uh, the ecosystem uh, where the fish are catched. And also we have a problem with the IU fishing, illegal, unreported, uh, and unregulated fishing, yeah? Uh, and, and the last is, I think we have also the beach uh, problem and also pollution with the uh, with the plastic. So if we uh, talk about the environmental uh, conservation, of course, uh, we can uh, we can say that the uh, environmental conservation is basically is a practice uh, of uh, uh, of uh, human to save the environmental from the collapsing uh, such a loss of the species ecosystem due to the uh, pollution and human activity uh, this help uh, the living biota and the ecosystem uh, if we can uh, conserve the environment uh, for our life and sustainable uh, for our life and sustainable uh, organism and ecosystem we know as a, a previous speaker mentioned that uh, uh, sometime we uh, cannot control our need so we are becoming greedy and uh, sometimes we are also ignorant with the uh, with the with the, our natural resources and then make some environmental damage uh, that can be a treat for the life and the sustainability of the organism and ecosystem and uh, the trend of natural uh, what we call management in uh, in uh, for the environmental management in Indonesia, uh, Indonesia uh, should be choose the uh, right site, yeah, uh, to be non-consumptive and try to be harmonized with the nature uh, that can make the green economy uh, by conservating the natural resources uh, with the ecological living standard, but. Uh, we can uh, deny that uh, in the practices we are in the left side because we are now very consumptive uh, uh, and make some uh, environmental degradation by exploiting the natural resources uh, without uh, without uh, any control uh, appropriate control and management so that's why uh, it's very important to manage our environment by uh, getting the acquiring the, the data so the people say that uh, no data is mean the no management this data is poor management and or uh, if you have the good data you can uh, pred, uh, you can uh, have the predicted uh, management so uh, of course uh, uh, previous, pre uh, previous uh, uh, dr gauri uh, gupta was already mentioned about the relationship uh, amongst the environment, uh, economic, and social uh, interaction. Yeah, so we need to get some uh, uh, interaction, the good interaction among three aspects. So we can uh, have the sustainable development if we can, in equilibrium, uh, promoting our economy by the resilience of the, our social uh, character um, and also by uh, controlling or managing our environment and uh, what i say that we need to 
to get the data related to how to manage uh, our uh, manage uh, our ecosystem i give you an, an example of uh, the uh, ecosystem monitoring in rio islands so uh, to give an idea an idea uh, uh, this is the map of the rio island province it is a uh, indonesian part but uh, neighboring with the uh, four country Singapore, Malaysia, and also uh, 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 Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, Brunei Darussalam, and also uh, Vietnam. So uh, uh, Rio Island consists by 2,408 islands, uh, and 96% of the our territory is the marine environment, uh, which is rich with the valuable ecosystem such as the coral reef grasses and mangrove so that's why uh, our university in collaboration with the indonesia institute for science through a project what we call the coral reef rehabilitation and management project uh, during the 2015 to 2019 make some monitoring of the environment i will show you some of the example uh, result in, uh, during our monitoring program uh, the highlight Oh, I'm sorry. I will show you uh, the, the the data I will show you is about the data from the uh, Natuna Archipelago uh, Municipality, Kabupaten Natuna, and also from the Linga. Yeah, and the value here is so the number of the station we, we use for the uh, coral reef, 19, and after seagrass uh, uh, mangrove uh, nine and seagrass one, for example, like that. Now I'm going to uh, uh, highlight uh, our result again to the coral reef. In the Natuna Island, we found the, the average of the coral reef coverage is about less than 22%. And in another uh, municipality, Linga, is uh, much higher, which is 35.7%. Uh, uh, the data is compared with the, our monitoring uh, uh, in 2016. Uh, we can say that in Natuna, there is some uh, slight increase in the coral coverage, it's about 0.86%. Uh, and in the Liga, it's more higher, it's about 6.8%. Uh, uh, and what we found uh, when we do the monitoring in this area, uh, we found uh, some uh, bleaching phenomena. So bleaching is mean the the, the the coral will uh, lose their color because uh, the living uh, living symbion Josantelae is go out from the coral tissue, so the coral will uh, lose their 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 color, and the symbiotic uh, mutualism between coral and the Josantella is getting lost, and that may, uh, may uh, uh, promoting the dead coral. Uh, another phenomenon we found is uh, uh, during the, our monitoring in 2019 is uh, we found the coral disease, yeah, coral disease in several spots. And also we found the sedimentation, uh, which is due to the uncovered uh, post mining bauxite so the uh, the land that which is cut uh, 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 i mean uh, mined but for the bauxite is not revegetated by the trees now so when the, there is a rain, there is a rain it will be make the erosion run of erosion that uh, of flowing the sedimentation to the uh, sea uh, after all, this is the our uh, uh, result uh, regarding to the mangrove. Yeah, uh, mangrove in Natuna is uh, coverage is very uh, good. Yeah, it's about seventy percent, and in Linga it's about uh, 65 percent. Yeah, but if we compare to the, our study in uh, three years before, there is some uh, decrease uh, uh, significant. In Natuna is about eight percent, and in Linga is about uh, less than four percent. And uh, what we found is about uh, 
the problem is related with the lodging of the uh, mangrove trees yeah and uh, the mangrove in since uh, Riau Island is the uh, is a, uh, small island archipelagic. So, uh, in terms of the diversity of the mangrove, we don't have so many mangroves. You know, in the world, uh, there will be about uh, 45 species, and uh, in this uh, province, we just found about uh, 12 or uh, 15 species. Uh, because mangroves normally should, uh, in relation with the uh, fresh water and also in the estuary. Uh, and the, in the Rio Ayam province, uh, we are in the ocean uh, or in the marine environment. And some uh, species we can find is the uh, Rizophora apicolata, Rizophora mucronata, and so on. Another ecosystem of ecosystem is uh, the sea grasses. Uh, I, uh, for the sea grasses, in Natuna, uh, the percent coverage is about 30%, in Linga is about 40%. And if we compare to the uh, uh, result in 2016, Natuna has a decrease, slight decrease. But in Linga, there is a good performance. Yeah. So uh, this is very interesting because in Indonesia, we just have 12 uh seagrass species but uh, in rio island we have 11 from them so uh, in terms of the seagrass uh, biodiversity uh, rio island is uh, has a good uh, great uh, biodiversity of seagrasses species and what we found also uh, there is a many epiphyte uh, or there is uh, many organism living also in the surface of the uh, seagrass leaf and we found also some sedimentation and many algae found uh, uh, living in this symbiote. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the name of the species is, uh, for example, in Halus aquaridae, Salacea hembrici, it is uh, ranked, uh, classified uh, according to the abundance. So the most uh, abundance uh, found is in Halus and following by Salacea and Simodosia serulata. And how about the fish? Yeah. If, uh, the fish in uh, coral reef area in Indonesia also uh, has uh, showed the, the decrease in linga, for example, decreasing the 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 fish found. Uh, we, we call the targeted fish because uh, there, there is only several fishes which is considered as the bio indicator of the health uh, coral reef health so if you found the uh, uh, the bay mass of the targeted species is uh, there is a reduction from uh, 1000 kilogram per hectare is becoming to only less than 300 uh, kilogram per hectare in 2018 uh, uh, yeah only two years but in natuna is about is contrary uh, the target fish biomass is about 300, and then uh, it become uh, uh, higher in 2018. It's about uh, maybe five five uh, times. So it's very interesting because uh, 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 there is a chance of the abundance of the fishes in both uh, uh, study area. And here some uh, example of the fish in the ecosystem coral system. Uh, for example, Celdinus in the latter, Scarpophorsteni, and also the green humpit uh, parrotfish, Bulbo motepon muricatium. Uh, another result is related with the megabenthos. What we call megabenthos because the the uh, biota is living. Uh, 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 in the substrate, yeah, and uh, in most of case, we found there is a decline of the abundance and diversity of the uh, macro megabetos during the three years of the monitoring. For example, this is maybe caused by the direct exploitation of uh, uh, the megabetos because, for example, in the left side, we have Tridacna, which is the, the giant clam, yeah, maybe the diameter is uh, more than 
70 cm yeah uh, and in natuna we have also the big one is about uh, uh, almost one meter the, the, the diameter and also for example the holoturidea yeah and uh, uh, gastropod so this is some uh, picture also to show you about the Tedaphna uh, maxima there is a holoturidea yeah uh, and many other species so please come to Indonesia to go, go dive in, in Natuna. Well, after uh, uh, we try to make uh, an index uh, to uh, facilitating us uh, to determine the status of the condition, the coral, hill, coral reef health index. Yeah? And basically, we use the modified World Bank uh, method, Dogma and Diasperes. Yeah? And in 2017, we uh, Indonesia or LIPI, I mean, the, uh, proposed the Indonesian coral reef health by including several uh, uh, aspects. For example, the coral coverage itself, the coral uh, feces, and the difference is the resilience. So, in this table, I am sorry that uh, not uh, translated in English, but uh, we build some indexes to help us to determine the condition of the coral. I just give you the example, the result, for example, in Natuna Island, we have uh, in several our point sampling, for example, it is very from the, uh, the index one to index, uh, index five, uh, seven, yeah, uh, seven. So uh, it's about, uh, in, in average, uh, Natuna is about 4.3. So the condition is not so good if we say uh, look here uh, five uh, five and six is about uh, uh, mediocre yeah in the middle i mean so this is the uh, the 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 method we define the start of the career and also even for the linga uh, from the several side we have uh, classified and also uh, put the indexes. Well, this is the way how to uh, for us how to to try to uh, better manage uh, our ecosystem for uh, um, many purposes. So uh, I think there is uh, we have to uh, work together. Uh, scientific uh, 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 different aspect yeah in, in scientific aspect for example we have to work with the leading in the city supported by the local and local government for example uh, umra our, um, our university is uh, collaborate with the 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 lipi lipi is the indonesian Institute for science and also i invite you uh, uh, the university or ngo from india to uh, come to Indonesia to make a uh, real island province as the locus for the research for the uh, to explore and to, uh, to explore the any possibility uh, study and we can be your partner uh, 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 to 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 get the, the good data and and such data will be helpful for better management. And also the government, I think the government should uh, use our data and then uh, with uh, academy, academician also will promote uh, uh, law or discuss various alternative with industry uh, regarding to the problem uh, in uh, our environment. Uh, we have also to, to support the education through the program in the first level concerning the environmental impact of the pollution, not only on the marine, but also for the uh, human tourism and economy. And we have also to empower our community by, uh, for example, supporting a program environmental conservation and pollution uh, into the village fund, yeah, but to develop the public awareness and to access the funding for the local program development. So this is some uh, picture uh, uh, when we do the uh, monitoring uh, program. And uh, uh, if you want to know about the result of the environmental monitoring in 
uh, Rio Island or in Indonesia, you can go to this uh, uh, website, yeah, uh, just to get the information about the coral reef ecosystem, uh, coral reef health uh, index, yeah. Uh, you can find this uh, website. The with this website is collaboration uh, uh, between Umra, Raja Ali Maritime University, and LIPI. LIPI is Indonesian Institute for Science through a program what we call the Coral Reef Rehabilitation and Management Project. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, now I give the uh, I will go back to the moderator. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Ms. Dita. Thank you so much, sir, for this informative presentation. So let us go to our next presenter, Dr. Mahala Chatterjee, Professor and former Director, Center for Urban Economic Studies. Ma'am. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Tilukoma Foundation, for giving me a chance to uh, talk with this esteemed panel. And this, uh, and also, good evening to all the viewers and uh, and of course the our my co-panelists. Now, uh, to be true to my own discipline, economics, let me start with uh, that uh, what environment does to us and what we do to the environment and what is the need for environmental conservation and so and so. Now, uh, when I talk about uh, talk about environment in urban areas, actually what happens that uh, urban area means that you are away from natural environment, you are in a built environment and you forget to think about the contribution of environment to your life and you forget and you continue to neglect it you continue to abuse it you forget about uh, forget about the benefits and uh, for your action for your action environment becomes uh, uh, environmental pollution and other things have become difficult we have just seen a very enlightening presentation on an island that how human activity affects the natural environment, the coral reef and others. Now let me start with what is the contribution of the environment? The contribution of the environment. Now firstly, uh, environment gives us amenities, enjoyable amenities like landscape, facilities like recreation, variety of flora and fauna, which makes human life after all enjoyable. Then of course, environment is still the only source of all the resources we use for agriculture, for industry, uh, forestry, mines, etc., uh, are, are still our only source of uh, source of our livelihood, our production system, and everything. Till now, we haven't been able to evolve any other alternative system. Then, so that all the natural resources uh, they are sourced from the environment around us. But again, what we do, we also use environment as a sink. Mm, as a sink, all waste products, all of the our waste products are for our, from our daily life, from our industrial activity, from our other types of activity, uh, or goes to the environment to different media like air, water, and soil. And uh, from time immemorial, the, uh, the earth, the mother earth, and the environment have been able to absorb some of these wastes, some of these wastes, but when the waste generation uh, or the sink activity of the environment is disproportionately high compared to the, its absorptive capacity, it affects, it is the root of all the problems and it affects all the amenities, landscape, uh, flora, fauna, uh, production system, agriculture, everything, hmm, everything. But problem with us, Though man is a very small unit in the whole universe, whole environment, uh, environment, in fact, uh, but we take an anthropocentric view of environment. Uh, we try to preserve everything beneficial to the human being, and we are not being uh, not at all 
concerned if we destroy uh, destroy those who are not beneficial to the environment now in our household we can we are very uh, within uh, seconds we can we can kill a mosquito or we can kill a fly we can kill a, kill a cockroach but we are more concerned with the so called uh, uh, so called uh, baby seals or others that is that is we are, we take a view that we will destroy something which is harmful to us and we will preserve which is not that harmful to us so this anthropocentric view is also causing some problems with the issue of environmental conservation now what are the uh, effects of human activity on environment hmm. now you see that uh, human activity each and every human activity causes some stress on the environment itself first is the eutrophic uh, eutrophic stress is caused by uh, decomposition of human body and other wastes then exploitative that what uh, whatever type of activity we do with the nature that agriculture will kill the soil we upturn the soil we put fertilizers chemical fertilizers in the soil or from the time beginning that we started hunting uh, when we started hunting and hunting once upon a time was considered one of the best game best uh, one of chivalry mm, chivalry then mining uh, mining again if the rate of exploitation is higher than the rate of reproduction that is the problem with mm, that is the problem with environment then disruptive and this is the point of concern that is chemical and industrial activities uh, now one of the we all know that one of the uh, very active industries one of the very important industries all of the world is the organic chemical industry which uh, uh, which in fact uh, uh, for the last 70 years in fact after the second world war uh, it was the most active industry and in a sense uh, this organic chemical industry along with others have caused more damage uh, to the world to the environment to the environment than anything else in fact the damage to the environment started with the industrial pollution uh, industrial revolution uh, in the mid 18th century from england and now that is for the first time man tried to break the cycles the natural cycles like the hydro cycle the agricultural cycle and everything and uh, and uh, uh, we have already heard that capitalism as capitalism is good if it is used wisely but it is bad if it is uh, if it is uncontrolled hmm. if it is uncontrolled so uh, so uh, this disruptive stresses sometimes they are not uh, they are not reversible and uh, they are not reversible now there are uh, the concept of sunk and fund pollutants that the pollutants some of them as i have already said that the mother nature has been able to uh, able to absorb able to uh, resilient itself uh, from the effect of them but some of them the mother nature is not being able to uh, able to recycle or anything they are stuck in the environment and they cause problem not only to the human beings but also other flora and fauna in the world now if uh, so this takes us to the necessity of conservation uh, necessity of conservation that we have to maintain the ecological balance uh, the uh, resource use should be controlled with lesser depletion the preservation of ecologically fragile and vulnerable areas uh, oh, vulnerable no. areas we sometimes we are not aware that no, how apne no. kholega how this ecologically fragile and vulnerable areas are actually adding to the resilient process uh, that we are uh, we think wetlands uh, they are of no use but they are on, of no use but uh, but we don't take into account the amount of oxygen generation and etc done by the wetlands uh, wetlands so uh, so the conservation of uh, conservation of uh, the ecological ecological balance and environment has become absolutely necessary now let me come to my 
the point that is the uh, that is coming to the case of urban areas now urban areas uh, are different from rural areas in different senses uh, firstly it is the uh, economic sin it is the economic point that is in urban areas the occupation of the residents are away from the nature they are mostly engaged in industrial or tertiary activities which is not directly related to nature as in rural areas where agriculture and related activities are more important then of course the demographic demographic for different reasons in urban areas the demographic balance is towards the male the, sometimes this is because of uh, because of the migration uh, sometimes uh, because of the age of the urban area newer urban areas are uh, are mostly inhabited by males and others but last and most important is the built up environment and infrastructure uh, infrastructure some of the infrastructure we see are essentially urban infrastructure now it is thought that with uh, uh, with uh, the, this uh, development of urban areas with the uh, with increasing gdp and others there should not be uh, there should not be any difference between the rural and urban areas in terms of infrastructure but till now uh, till now there are some infrastructures which are which are definitely definitely urban in nature hmm. urban in nature so when we talk about sustainable development and uh, sustainability of urban areas let me um, uh, let me uh, take a different view uh, so that we can understand and when we talk about sustainability conservation etc we either take a very local view uh, very local view we are concerned with a very micro part of the uh, of an area and look at its sustainability or sometimes we take a very global view that what is happening to the ozone layer what is happening uh, why is acid rain happening and the so called climate change uh, climate change global warming etc huh. but uh, if you look at this if you look at this that uh, the discussions are mostly concerned with efficient utilization or reducing depletion of resources maintaining biodiversity and preservation of endangered species etc 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 but uh, the problem is problem is that all the discussions usually take an anti industrial and anti urban stand but in the as the new millennium is of uh, the century of urbanization at this juncture of civilization where more than 50% of the total population lives in urban areas we cannot no one can go back to the forest based pastoral civilization even in the so called uh, ecotourism projects and one uh, ecotourism projects uh, one cannot do away with electricity and telecommunications to essential components of modern civilization so it is uh, essential to think of sustainable development accepting the reality of urban areas with their goods and ba bads now let me now decompose the issue of sustainability into three parts the firstly economic in, then second infrastructure and thirdly ecological and i would like to put it in a situation uh, when these three are in circular flow now any area any urban area it uh it survives on its economic condition its economic stability now in the advent of urbanization we have seen uh, we have seen various cases where uh, cities uh, so little towns grew up on depending on a particular on a, on a single mine or a single uh, factory or anything and when this mine was exhausted or the factory stopped functioning the the town town in fact became dead hmm. we have heard about the ghost towns and others uh, lots of ghost towns uh, the older western film films showed us about lot ghost towns etc hmm. but now the cities are centers of multifarious activities 
and this multifarious activities give them economic stability and this is not only for the dwellers of the city but also the dwellers from the surrounding uh, surrounding the latest trend in indian urbanization is commutation where the people working in urban areas they stay in uh, stay in surrounding smaller urban areas or rural areas and with development of transportation they could come to their uh, come to their workplace and go back to them so economic stability is one of the things which is most essential for 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 sustenance of an urban area then now i come to the next thing that is the infrastructure now as i have already told that infrastructure so that an urban area is different from the rural area a uh, rural area in the sense that it is away from nature it is most of built up environment uh, environment rather than uh, rather than near the green environment uh, green nature or something and this takes us this takes us to the essentiality of urban infrastructure and services like water supply like solid waste management like sewerage and drainage system etc now these are essential components of any urban life now if we do not if we do not have uh, we do not have this infrastructure we do not maintain them we do not go on creating these infrastructures uh, infrastructures this will hamper the ecological stability of the area hmm, of the area clog drains will cause uh, water logging hmm, less of water supply will lead to public health problems and uh, not uh, not a very well, good uh, solid waste management system would lead to other diseases etc and the place will not be livable yeah. and again if there is no ecological stability ecological stability that will again go on that will go on to the other point that uh, if the place is not very livable then the economic activities will also not be Uh, uh, viable there, and so it will go round in a circular manner. Uh, so, so if we want to want to preserve the urban areas, we have to think about we have to think about the these three components of stability and their relationship and the relationship, and uh, we have to take a holistic view about the conservation of environment in urban areas. Uh, we have to preserve the green spaces we have to preserve the uh, preserve the water bodies etc because everything is linked with the other and of course the regular maintenance of the infrastructure in the structure and this conservation of uh, uh, conservation of environment is very much linked with the sustainable development goals uh, some of the sustainable development goals are directly linked with the uh, conservation of environment and like the the goal number 6 that is clean water and health sanitation i've already told you that an urban area will not be able to survive if there is a regular supply of regular supply of potable water for not only for drinking but also for other purposes everybody knows about the town of fatehpur sikri which akbar built with much grandeur uh, to shift his capital there but he has to abandon that and go back to agra once again just because just because water was not available in fatehpur sikri then affordable and clean energy now one of the uh, as i have already told the electricity is an essential component of today's uh, civilization but still now we are dependent on fossil fuel for the production of energy and this causes a number of uh, problems number of problems including pollution and others so affordable and clean energy that is the goal number 7 then goal number 9 that in industry innovation and infrastructure i have already talked about in infrastructure and industry and innovation implies that we generate we should shift towards more towards uh, uh, green technology green technology that we should tap pollution Uh, at the starting point rather than controlling it in the end point then that takes me to my only point that sustainable cities and communities how can cities and citizens survive in an environmentally uh, environmentally beneficial way hmm. then uh, 
Our previous speaker already talked about climate actions. Now, climate action is sometimes specific to a city that how we can reduce the heat islands and others, uh, or sometimes it is taken up at the global level that how should we, uh, we approach the problem of carbon emission or ozone depletion. Then goal number 14 and 15, that is life below water and life on land. Life on land, my previous speaker has given a very good example uh, from an island of Indonesia hmm, about life below water around an island and how uh, that is affected by life on land and uh, cyclically life on land is affected by life underwater. Uh, underwater. Now we should take a uh, so on the whole that if we have to survive in this world, uh, in this world, in a in an urban world, uh, to very specific in the urban world, we have to take up a holistic view. Holistic view. We have to think, uh, think of. We have to think of more and more green uh, production systems yeah, and, and maintaining maintaining the so called uh, so called infrastructure the infrastructure in a good way so that it leads to ecological stability ecological stability and of course there are some specific problems of environmental conservation uh, environmental conservation which uh, which should be taken up at a local level so it should be uh, it should be a case of local and global uh, there is no question of local versus global and for that the most important part is that increasing awareness increasing awareness from uh, from the uh, the bill of the lowest rung of the pyramid and participatory participatory development participatory development taking into account each and every stakeholder uh, stakeholder in the urban life uh, so i end here and thank you for your patience thank you so much ma'am so let us go to our next presenter uh, to see Ma, can I take your leave now because I have to attend okay, some okay, engagement. Sir. Thank you so, so much for I your time, like sir. Thank you once again. And I would like to take your leave and wish you a very successful conference. And before I leave, I'd also like to show you this book which I had written uh, on the environment. It's titled Limits of Consumption. Uh, it was published in 2018 from UK. And this specifies the specific problems uh, concerning environmental degradation all over the world. So I would uh, uh, like to wish all of you a successful conference and thank you for inviting me and wish you all the best. Thank you. Sir. Dr. Gauri, I will contact you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have been to your ideal country, Indonesia. And okay. To, to attend some conferences. I know the island countries are much more fragile than the other countries in terms of environmental degradation. Okay, thank you. I will contact you later. I will ask to the committee to give me your contact. Yeah? Oh, thank you. Thank you I very much. Please stay in contact and we will get in touch with each other. Okay, okay thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so let us go to Dr. Niranjan, you are there? Uh, yes, sir. So let us go to our next presenter, Dr. Niranjan Kumar, scientist and joint director, Government of India. Sir, I have your slides and I will be presenting your uh, slides on my share screen. Should I start, sir? Sir, please unmute, unmute your video. my okay. topic okay, i'd like to start to show the slides okay sir i'm starting sorry uh, i belong to the sericulture of india as you know please so sir are the slides visible no 
now yes, sir give me a minute it's connecting now sir no Double now, sir. if not, it will be connect. It will be connecting. Now they are showing, sir. Not come. Yeah, now it has come. Okay, okay. Sir. Are you seeing? Sir, if, uh, yeah. okay. Okay, I am presenting from my okay, side. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So, this is the slides. So, with the Seri Biodiversity Conservation Environment. So, I am presenting the overview on the Tassar culture, how it transformed into the Tassar silk industry. So I would like to mention here that India has the monopoly of having five types of the silks. These are these are Asar, Muga, Eri, and Alberi, as you know. So here. This. Now, I would like to tell that this Indian silk of salient features is having the salient features of five things. The Seri biodiversity in India is a monopoly in world. Why? Because five types of silks are available. And the silk is the queen of textile, having huge global market potential. The raw silk production is completely a green process, and the raw silk production involves poorest of the poorer farmers' cash crop. That is how we are transforming the poor people to lift up to the rich one. The organic silk production is well under progress, the so wild silk constitute the exclusive part of green silk textile directly involved convergence of the various green technologies and indirectly also involves various innovative green te technologies. Now, I would like to show you next, 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 the running of slide. I want the running. So this Tassar is available all over India and it has originated from, so you are seeing here the diversity of the silk, the mulberry available all through the India, Tassar in the area of Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, Bengal, Maharashtra and Andhra Pradesh. The Moga is confined to the Asham and the area is countrywide and all over the world. Now, I would like to mention that this Tassa has originated in Jharkhand area and has dispersed from here in form of a eco race called Daba, which has been practiced by the tribals since time immemorial. Means I should like, I would like to mention here that wild silk which is present in India has its ancient history since 2500 BC in the Indus Valley civilization. It is not like that, that the mulberry which has come from China, uh, that is no doubt had a spread, but the wild silk, which is available, the Antheria milita truri, it has all the ancient history and the tribals were practicing it. The tribal of Jharkhand, Ho Munda and Santhal, they were practicing and all the tribes of other states, they also do it. It's a forest culture and it's completely organic and a green 
textile silk, which is very costly. And in this way, I would like to mention that the green uh, uh, conservation is uh, taking place because we are planting the host plant because they feed on the host plant for the mulberry, you know, uh, morus alba. And for the tusser, it is soria robusta, Ranmilaria tomentosa, and Termilaria arjuna. So this, uh, the forest coverage in the tusser food plants in the various states are described here. Hello, Ashok. Uh, sure. Now I come to the process, the plantation, rearing, cocoon production, cocoon drying, and a reeling, a spinning, uh, and the fabric formation. So there are two main types. The pre cocoon is completely up to the raw silk production, it's a green technology means involving no chemical. It's an organic also because it's a forest produce culture. Now come to the, uh, come to the aspects of the unique features of uh, the silk. It's a low investment and high return, diverse silk components, and a 90% rural employment, rural women and tribal employment, a huge host plant availability in the area of the states of Jharkhand. You know that uh, favor ecology and environment. These are the unique feature. Provides livelihood to around 3.5 lakh people of the tribes and the farmers. And the congruence with our traditional culture means we are maintaining the biodiversity and conserving it we are putting the plantation. Now come to, there are certain schemes under which we are promoting the silk production. These are the catalytic development programs, central sector programs, issued village linkage programs, Mahila Kisan Sasakti Karan programs, Manrega, self-help groups, women in private and northeast uh, uh, region textile. Now this uh, Tassar production has increased in Jharkhand about 19 fold by conservation. Livelihood opportunities in Tassar. I would like to mention here that if a person is collecting a cocoon of 20,000, he can produce that DFL and Uh, that I have told you, ample opportunities with huge potential in silk and beyond silk. Beyond silk, what I am telling, and beyond textile, there are the sericines formed when the cocoon are boiled, then there is a two component in the silk filament, fibron and sericine. When the sericine is a packing material, fibron is a part of the filament. So when the sericine come out from the cocoon, these sericine are the biomaterial which are utilized in the pharmaceutical industry for various purposes. So there are immense opportunities in utilization of this biodiversity of the silk in textile in addition to the extra textile avenues. Next. We come to the area in which uh, these are the some of the aspects of the conservation, conservation technology how we are utilizing. You are seeing here 
from jharkhand it has spread to the different parts of the state and in jharkhand there is a daba variety which is country wide adopted and can be reared everywhere not only in the country but abroad also it has become a ruling variety a captive reared variety now how we are conserving it it is indicated in the photographs we are putting the cocoon from where the male and female moth So the uh, so the um, con conservation we are taking for the in situ uh, ecosystems. In situ ecosystems means the ecosystems which are actuating in the inside the forest. They are not outside inside the forest. But we collect it from the forest and bring it outside. Then there is a ex situ conservation. So the breeding or the expansion of the centers of government of India Central Silk Board, they are nothing but the multiplication farms, large scale breeding farms of the silk worm under ex situ condition. Now we are collecting the cocoon and then we are processing for the yarn. These are the natural yarn and the machines which handle for production of yarn. In a Kamden, MRTM and MTRM, there are various variation. Some are producing 200 gram per day, or some are producing 300, some are producing 500, like that. Now, this is about uh, exceptionally high productivity of wild dava which is which is to be utilized in a larger scale as i have opened a center for it in chai basa chakradarpur from where this will ex expand at large scale for this we have surveyed some of the farms and uh, farmers of different villages how much cocoon they are collecting and how much earning they are doing and how much we could add, add on there so these are the villages from where the cocoons can be taken. Now this natural daba to captive daba. I mean to say that there is a uh, eco race which is wild and they perpetuate in the nature from wild to wild. And if we bring, they become semi-wild. And from the semi-wild, we make it a uh, captive rear. So this is while to say while cocoon to grenade, this is the process by which it is formed. And next, come to say while to captive reared, that means it is captive reared, it can be reared everywhere. Now, for the conservation, we are doing various methods the in situ and the ex situ. These are certain of the uh, glimpses in which the soya robust plant carrying the cocoon of wild daba and now see how the larvae the weight of larvae that corresponds to the weight of the cocoon high weight of the larvae is this is the sun
So the conservation is the Technology in with the products Some of the uh, various utilities from the biodiversity and conservation of tropical thistle silk worm. Now, come to the next point in which we, we want to tell that how the additional byproducts are utilized for the enhancement of the income of the farmer. The serine it is used in cosmetic, anti-cursor, biomedical, the coconage, the proteolytic biomedical, and the pupae are the food for the fishes. Liters are also as a um, um, uh, as a green um, farm at manure. Now, there are certain process for this. Now, come to our prospective process for speed development of the silk industry. The byproduct was utilization, ideal condition for byproduct, crop rescheduling, population of byproduct, mechanization of byproduct. Uh, have a
Hello everyone. Uh, there has been some technical issues for the last uh, slides and I had to go out for a while. I think uh, there are issues with uh, uh, the Kumar's uh, net as well. I would request uh, yes, Dr. Sir. Yadav, Dr. Madan Yadav and uh, Ms. Tushima Datta to kindly ensure that our session can proceed and you know if you can also talk about the slides or something. Like, let's proceed with this. Yes, so, so um, Dr. Niranjan had. His internet is extremely unstable, as far as I can see. Okay, okay, okay. But he's there. We are trying to connect with him. Let's see. Okay, okay. Let us wait uh, for some time. Any comments in between from Dr. Madhani Yadav, maybe? Yeah, it's better, to, it's better to escape the slide if yes. there is some technical issue. Yes. Thanks. Better to skip the slide, please. Dr. Yadav, you can make a few comments at this point. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. First, I, I would like to congratulate the, the director of the Lotoma Foundation, Mr. Shoham Das, to, who organized this wonderful uh, webinar in the time of pandemic. Second, I would like to congratulate all distinguished guests for their wonderful presentations regarding whatever the we are facing the environmental preservations. But one thing we know that today, whatever we are facing today, it is not a the one day or single day problems. If you look at the history, environmental conservation is the one of the most important challenges who reshaping the world politics today. Whatever we quote and quote say environmental politics. Yeah, whatever you can say environmental security. Second things, we can say the whole world is trying to address the challenges of environmental security. Second things, we know that the whatever the politics, the green politics or whatever the theory, but in different dynamics of the, the, the situations, in the, in the environmental, because there is no any, this is the boundaryless issues. We cannot say okay, whatever the, the problems facing by India or Indonesia or US, it is the different. All are facing, but there is some issues from the different dynamics. First, we have to, whatever the perspective from the global south. We are addressing the industrial challenges. Second thing, the similar, we are also facing the environmental challenges. But everyone is would like to find out the solutions. Even then, the, in, the government of India has set up many nodal agencies. But if you look at the history, the politics, whatever the society, either we have the, I think there are two options, two choices for us. One is the Gandhian approach, or second thing, we go through the whatever the role theory of justice. They also included the quote and the climate justice with the along with the social justice. What about the Gandhian approach to addressing the challenges of environment across the world, not inside the particular country, particular region, or particular state? or whatever the regional level, national level, or global levels. How to manage the sustainability in the society, the ecosystems. Second thing, the managing the society, politics, economics. No doubt, everybody wants the industrial development, economic growth, but at what cost? This is the important. Second thing, we have to have a limited natural resources. Whatever the exploitation of resources, we look at the whatever the last 30 years, whatever the devastations we are facing, degradation of environments, whatever the Gandhi says, you have to manage a sustainable growth, sustainable society, whatever the ecosystems. If you look at the village economy to the national economy to the world economy, you have to access the limited resources natural resources to maintain the balanced approach 
with the, your nature. Second thing, second thing, if you look at what about the John's role, who quote unquote say theory of justice, that is the climate justice. He has beautifully analyzed arguments that in the law of the people, the justice is important for every, every society. So that's why he included the justice with nature, justice with environment, like the social justice with environmental justice. So if you look at the whatever the, 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 the international conference or climate or any other things, the inter international agencies like UNDP, UNEP, they all are considers it is important how to do, how to deal with the climate justice. Whatever the, our speakers, they addressing their regional and national issues. Yeah, that's fine. But ecosystem, biodiversity, or whatever the, it's the global problems. So you have a very sustainable approach, comprehensive approach for addressing the challenges of environment protections, whatever you can say, environmental security with the sustainable of natural resources, our ecosystems. End of the day, end of the, uh, this session, uh, uh, my point, I, will, I would like to finally fi uh, find out, say, say that, I'm concluding that this is important for each and every life on the earth. We know that there is a only earth in the universe. It is not a your problems. It is not my problem. It is not a problems of the developing countries or emerging economy or whatever the developing states. Either America to the China, to India, to Indonesia, to Bangladesh or Kazakhstan or to Russia. Every country is facing the severe challenges of environmental degradations. So you have to think together to find out the solutions. You have to maintain the balanced approach with the environment, the nature, the limitation of natural resources, access of natural resources, whatever we can say, the, the justice with the climate. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So let us go to the next presenter, Dr. Arijit Chatterjee. Faculty, Ashutosh College, University of Calcutta. Dr. Chatterjee, you're there. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah. Am I visible or audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. And visible, I also. Yes, sir. Um... Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Should I start? Yes, sir, please. Okay. Just uh, let me share the screen first. Just, just a second. I'm sharing the screen. It's visible. It's visible. No, sir, till now it's not. Uh, I, 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 I yes, sir, it. it is visible now. Okay, okay. 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 Please proceed. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. And thank you, uh, Tushima, and thank you, uh, Tilottama Foundation, for giving me this opportunity to share my views on this particular conservation uh, thing. Uh, today, I am going to discuss about uh, about the conservation of wildlife in villages, our tradition. So uh, the first thing first, uh, uh, as the title mentioned, when we think about the term wild, what are the things that came to our mind? Okay, uh, that mind, when you think about the habitat, wild habitat, that 
came from in the lash greena forest or the widely spread uh, mountain or the pristine beaches or something this kind of uh, places where human invention is uh, completely either nil or uh, very much restricted and when i think about the wild life uh, this kind of pictures that came to our mind that that this kind of large charismatic megawatt birds like uh, the tiger the elephant the lion the peacock the crocodiles this kind of uh, uh, this kind of things uh, came to our mind but uh, actually what the wildlife actually is according to the definition the wildlife is uh, those species which are not domesticated at all uh, whose survival are not uh, do not depends on the humans and whose reproduction and growth are not tampered or manipulated by humans or more in scientific terminology we can say that the species who are evolved through the natural selection process the evolution uh, the natural selection uh, so these species are called wild and that ranges from a small fungus to simple fungus to a complicated large vertebrates like jackals or snakes or every in human being also and this all are actually wildlife there's all the species are uh, all the species are actually fulfill the characters that i mentioned in the previous slides uh, this these all are called wildlife because they are naturally occurring naturally surviving and naturally propagating now the next point when we think about the term conservation the conservation of wildlife what are the things that came to our mind uh, it actually came to our mind that uh, the conservation the perception of conservation revolves around the concept of mostly the either the protected area that is a national park sanctuaries or uh, reserve forest conservation reserves like that uh, or uh, the zoos or the animal park like that but in all the cases uh, the species are conserved or protected uh, with the uh, whether human involvement is either restricted or nil the iso they are just isolated them from the any kind of human involvement so this is actually the natural or the common process of conservation in this uh, indian scenario or in most of the part of the world the number of protected areas in india is 668 and the total geographic area that covers uh, it's approximately less than 5% that means a very minimum percent that came under this protected area and that means the a huge number of area huge amount of area that is untouched and so called unprotected uh, according to the definition of uh, according to the 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 wildlife uh, scenario of india so that means uh, these places are unprotected so that must that means we are mostly focuses or mostly give our all the funds and efforts to this 5% area and the other parts are nearly untouched and in the west bengal is also a uh, situation is the same if not the bad uh now the uh, latter part that is the other uh, uh, word that mentioned in the title that is the village so what what when you think about a village uh the village the picture that came to our mind uh, in village that it must be a mud hut uh, with dotted of uh, water bodies ponds and canals and the uh, lush green of a uh, uh, crop field and the animal that it comprise mostly that is the cattle or the poultry or the domesticated ducks like that but that is actually not true because there are many wild species the wildlife uh, so called quote unquote wildlife uh, though are important from the conservation point of view these species are also inhabit in the in the village area like uh, different mammals like jackals mongooses squirrels rats different kind of birds uh, different kind of snakes uh, monitor lizards uh, turtles uh, geckos uh, Uh, uh different kind of frogs this all are wildlife species uh, uh those those all are need to be conserved they are found within the villages so uh these are actually the traditional inhabiting the village are not found recently they are uh, living uh, there from the last thousands and thousands of years so the question actually arises that how do they exist in the villages if there is no so called protection measure how do they exist in uh, we are all the efforts giving to the uh, uh, protected areas or the forests or the other wild habitats but not giving to these areas 
but still they are managed to survive within the village areas without any kind of formal protection measure so that is our question to find out that is our point of discussion uh, for that uh, a study was conducted in the southern part of west bengal over 13 districts 42 blocks and 141 villages and uh, the first thing that uh, i try to find out that that the how many species how many wildlife actually inhabit within the villages it's not possible to include all the wild species so i mostly focuses on the large vertebrate species specifically reptiles and mammals so how many reptiles mammals are found within the villages uh, this table will give you a glimpse of idea that the village habitat at the right part right a uh, right column of the table that gives you an, gives you an idea that uh, it consists of 475 wildlife species that found in the villages and that is nearly near to the all over uh, the the if we in, uh, it's very near to the number that uh, if we include the protected areas uh, within this thing that is the 550 so there is no such big difference between the protected areas and the unprotected areas uh, the, the the uh uh if we consider the species richness and not uh, and uh, this graph this is a simple graph will uh, give you an idea that the the total 40 species of mammals and 52 species of reptiles are found in all over the south bengal southern part of west bengal and each village the average number of uh, species that found in each village that average number number of mammals is approximately 24 and uh it's approximately 38 number of reptiles uh, found in each village. So that means the number is not very less. There are in a, a, a hefty amount of number you can find in each village, that is 24 and 38. And not only that, uh, some species that found in the villages, if we consider only mammals and reptiles, are 92 total species found in uh, uh, the mammals and reptiles found in the villages. Out of that, approximately th uh, it's 34, that is, uh, approximately 31 percent more than 31 percent of the total mammals and reptile species are considered under schedule one and schedule two that is the topmost uh, the uh, category of the uh, wildlife protection act that that means it, this kind of species need very much importance uh, with the point of view of conservation uh, the this graph will show that uh, the the sighting frequency the it's not that the, the, the species are living there and they're not sighted well but the sighting frequency is also very high the, out of the 92 the 17 mammals and 24 reptiles are frequently sighted in the villages uh, uh, our in-depth survey was done with the monitor lizards uh, in, uh, in the whole southern Bengal region to understand the actual number of the species the actual number of these three species and uh, in some places the right uh, map the right side map will show you in some places that the number of individual per square kilometer in some villages is approximately more than 100 in some places so this is a huge huge thing and this monitor lizard i have to mention that this monitor lizard is actually a schedule one species that means it's a it's it includes the top priority uh, for conservation. So this, uh, this schedule and species are freely living in a huge number within the village habitat and this is not uh, uh, and where there, there is no call such protection but still they are living and they are living for last thousands of years. So the second part of the question is the first we know that the how many species and uh, what are their importance uh, uh, there and, and all that we know and now so, uh, the question came that where the where they live actually uh, uh, in the villages are there any kind of special areas there where they live and in villages in every part in every habitat type in village you can find crop field you can find bushes you can find uh, household places settlements in everywhere you can find uh, wildlife in some places you can find more and some places uh, uh, the number is less but everywhere you can find so i'm i'm going to a bit a bit details about that this is a just schematic diagram of a village uh, the yellow part showing the crop field and the green part showing the settlement and the blue is the uh, the pond so uh, in 
in pond you can find uh, the monitor lizard uh, the turtles and different water snakes uh, in crawfish you can find field rats and uh, wild uh, uh, indian hares uh, in the bushes you can find uh, foxes and different birds and even the household you can find uh, different uh, different mice uh, the rats and mice so which is also wildlife species i am going to a uh, bit details about this this is a uh, I, this is a crop field covered with uh, paddy and water and in in crop field you can find 47 species uh, total and some are living in the barn area that is the dry area and some are living in the wet area uh, it's same as in the bushes and tree groves uh, you can find anywhere in the uh, in the villages this is a bush uh, a scattered bush and this is a tree grove the bush with the trees and there this is the the richest part the the, the most important part in the village that out of the 92 species 74 are found in these bushes some lives within the bush area some lives above the uh, tree and like that there's a uh, the uh, hanuman langur jackal jungle cat here different snakes they live uh, uh, prefer to live in these places as as like that i'm not going into details as like that in the there are water bodies where some species uh, prefer to live uh, there are some rivers and canals there are some species prefer to live uh, there are rocky outcrops in the uh, in the uh, district of purulia and the bakuda and some part of west midnapur you can find this kind of rocky outcrops where in this the the, uh, the within the um, within the uh, the glitches of this uh, uh, this uh, uh, rocks uh, you can find the, the several species uh, love to decide uh, this it is used as a, as a safe adob uh, uh, this is kind of species you can find in the rocky outcrop and this this is a road roadside the roadside also uh, are very important for sometimes important for different species at the roadside you can find different kind of snakes in sundarbans uh, in the south of Shwagana, different part of the sundarbans the common crate is very common uh, is very common within the uh, the the bricks in between the bricks of the roads and different kings and other species you can also find just a uh, side of the uh, this side of the uh, roads uh even the houses that the most so-called most disturbed area it must be the most disturbed area because the human involvement is more this is the highest uh there you can also find the 26 species of mammals and reptiles uh like this there's other sea waves there are the rats there are several snakes so there are a diverse number of uh mammals and reptiles you can find within the uh within the household uh they are they are use these places uh, also they are the safe uh, safe habitat so uh, uh, this is actually given idea i am i'm also going to a, a specific kind of habitat uh, that is a sacred grove in some villages there are there are thing called sacred grove that is a small uh, forest a small uh, tree groves actually uh, they are maintained by the local villagers these are highly protected and they are it's actually devoted or dedicated to the particular deity uh, by uh, of that and the, at, because of this high protection measure because they uh, worship this place and they uh, just control any kind of uh, interference or any kind of uh, disturbance within the uh, within this grove area and this become a very important habitat for several several animals and the, this, uh, this graph will uh, give an idea about the densities. Tree density is very high within the grove in compare. There's a, there a study was done in uh, 677 groves in the South Bengal. And all the cases, the densities are uh, 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 far more higher in compared to the other part of the villages. And the right part showing the tree injury marking, that actually the quantification type of the uh, the the disturbance uh, of uh, and that is also very less within the grove area and it's that i previously mentioned that 12 to 15 species of mammals and 18 to 20 species of reptiles are found in each separate groups so uh, in each tribal the interesting thing is that in all over the india each tribal village has their own sacred grove and uh, it is documented that approximately 14,000, 13,000, uh, I'm audible, sorry. 
with some issue. Okay, okay. So uh, there are thirteen thousand seven twenty second doses now documented from India, but uh, a study says that there are more than a lakh, more than a lakh second doses are found uh, within uh, India, or uh, that's not yet documented. And in West Bengal, there are approximately six seventy second doses are documented from India. They all are maintained. There is no any kind of legal issues, legal interference by government. All are maintained by the the local villagers, the neighborhood villagers, the native people, the indigenous people. They maintain that places. So from this part, we can understand the first the first part. We understood that there is a uh, the number of species, the species distribution, and the, the second part uh, we understood that the where they prefer to live. That means the number of species that is very good, and their places of uh, the habitat that is also sufficient for uh, to decide them within the villages. Uh, there are some other incidents that's not part of my study and different parts of India. There are two incidents uh, that I visited. There is a place called Charota in uh, Anand, Gujarat, where uh, the the marsh crocodile. There's a very highly ferocious uh, species, and it's also a shrew species that live within the village. Well, this is the tank. You can see see that the the opposite part part of the bank of this tank. There's a uh, the uh, the uh, embankment and the uh, uh, where some humans are moving uh, around. And there's a there's a uh, crocodile resting the other side. So in a two day census that we participated, at, there are about one fifty nine marsh crocodile are uh, uh, documented from this human habitat. So that is uh, a very uh, 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 interesting. And there is other uh, places called Vetnoi Odisha. Most of the people know about that. There are the sixteen hundred black black bucks uh, in yearly. They roam freely within the forty square kilometer area within the village area. That's a, a opposite part. There's a cycle. Uh, a person is moving through a cycle, and the uh, black buck uh, is just uh, just running in front of them. So that means they are not fear feared about that, and they are very very accustomed with the uh, human uh, interference there so finally uh, the last question of this part that is that why uh, the first is how many species inhabit and where they inhabit then the final one is the most important of why do they survive the uh, the general notion is the people actually are the anti wildlife because of their ferociousness because if they are harmful and something like that this is a common perception but still despite of this kind of perception why do they actually survive this common perception is actually real or there are some differences the because uh, the, the if villagers they, if they want they can easily kill or hunt or chase away this species from their territory so that's not at all a problem but still they tolerate them in their neighborhood that's the reason what are the reason behind this that's i am trying to find out the first one is uh, the major uh, major reason for um, tolerating them is the the religious belief around uh, around this species the the the, the right uh, uppermost right corners photo that showing that a, a, a person is worshiping a particular plant it's in a tribal sacred group in uh in bakura and the uh, the uh, the right uh, the left uh, the lower part of the left that the common uh, uh, the monoclet cobra it's also worship uh, as the vastu sap vastu sap means it's a it's a uh, it's a uh, the, the the villagers actually in some play, villages the few houses this uh, speak uh, sometimes uh, most of the times they uh, uh, build their uh, uh, home uh, that 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 house actually uh, the other people the other human being also lived in this house and the snakes also lived they coexist together and the humans uh, tolerate them because they feel that they feel that uh, the presence of these uh, snakes uh, as they are uh, living from the generation after generation that presence of their uh the snakes actually bring the wealth for the family okay maybe this is a superstition but indirectly it actually helps to maintain or helps to survive within in just adjacent to the uh, the human uh, territory 
and the right one the lower right one uh, species is a uh, ornamental snake it's a very commonly the uh, involved or included in the folk tales of uh, bengal that is the chundi mongol uh, is a, that is the monsha mongol part that's a, it's related to the uh, goddess Man manusha and the behula lokinda so this is these are the these are the belief and it include uh, most of the species have this kind of uh, beliefs so that's actually help them to sustain within the uh, from the fear or something religious uh, beliefs they didn't kill they, they don't kill or harm the species there are some social taboos uh, also there that these two are the pictures of upper one picture that earlier mentioned that's a vet noi and uh, lower one, one is a sacred groves of uh, bakura uh, these the both the cases the villagers believe that the presence of these species they actually prefer to come before or the middle of the rain rainy monsoon and the villi villagers believe that if the huge number of species came at that year that will uh, that will actually uh, uh, that will actually uh, 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 actually bring more rain more rainfall that will uh, cause more rainfall and which uh, further uh, help to cultivate more paddy so that means indirectly that means the the well the village well the well the economics actually related to this uh, again also maybe this is this is not the, uh, the maybe some point this is a superstition or something like that but still this superstition is indirectly uh, indirectly help to protect them within the villages oh the, the most interesting part is the some species actually are beneficial uh, like monitor lizards, monitor lizards is found in all over the southern part of West Bengal. It's actually all over the West Bengal. In every part, the local people knows that this uh, the present uh, this uh, monitor lizards prefer to eat snakes, and uh, they believe that if uh, snakes, uh, uh, if monitor lizard stays uh, around the uh, around the villages, the snake population will under control. And obviously, snakes are according to the villagers are more harmful. Uh, than the monitor lizard, so that's why they tolerate monitor lizards. And apart from that, monitor lizards also eat uh, different corpses and characters and clean the village area. Uh, the uh, the jackal is also sometimes beneficial because jackal eat the crabs from the crop. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a fox. This fox is in the uh, in the crabs within the crop field, and crabs are the one kind of paste for the newly grown crop. And the, uh, the last one is a rat snake. Rat snake eat the rat within the crop field and rats are the uh, one of the most uh, important, most uh, harmful paste uh, of the paddy. So these all actually play some, somehow or other some beneficial role and that help them to uh, stay or uh, live within the villages. Uh, sorry. Uh, there are some species also have uh, some aesthetic values uh, that also the villagers feel proud of, like uh, pythons, uh, like uh, yellow monitors or fishing cats. And there are another interesting thing is that some habitats are actually the big, uh, the byproduct of the uh, different human activities. That some uh, some uh, space places are have uh, they, they don't have any kind of ownership or there are some legal issues between the two plots and these kind of plots turn into a wild habitat and that uh, different kind of uh, wildlife actually decide there or uh, use that as their use that as their um, as their uh, preferable habitat uh, some uh, animals are also good source of, of protein uh, the tribal people are mostly depends on their protein source came from those wild animals uh, they prefer to eat uh, monitor lizards or, or the rats or different other species squirrels and other species and they are made they are so economically poor they use uh, this uh, the hunt and kill those species and this is also part of the tradition uh, they hunt and kill the species and use as their protein diet and finally, the uh, the love for the living organisms. There is a sheer love in all the people we have. Uh, the love for the uh, organisms, uh, living organisms, and that's also play always also play a crucial role for uh, maintaining the species. Because any cause, nobody can want to harm any kind of uh, uh, 
other living organisms. So these are the actually main factor for maintaining them within the village area. So there are uh, some uh, a little graph. I'm not going to discuss. It, it is showing that the number of species and their um, the the why they are actually uh, uh, conserved within the villages. So we can we can summarize the whole thing uh, with this kind of note. That the first question that I uh, that I raised that uh, how many species that inhabit the richness and abundance of species uh, within the villages are high. That's already proved. And uh, there are uh, the second question answered that the presence of uh, a good number of a good amount of preferable habitat still exist. And third, why do they survive? This question answered that the sustainable utilization of resources. Okay, so that means when uh, the, the local native people they use the resources from the wildlife or from the wild habitat, but they always use it sustainably. They are not hunt uh, unnecessarily or they don't hunt uh, the pregnant uh, uh, the pregnant organisms or they don't, uh, if uh, required, they just, uh, they just keep the hunting in some times definitely there are some exceptions but most of the cases they use sustainable uh, sustainably use the resources because they know that if they are completely wiped out the whole thing the whole wildlife resources their the upcoming generation of them they don't use they don't utilize that utilize that resources and the second point the second uh, the uh, part is that, that, that they have the people have the deep understanding of traditional management of habitat and species. Nowadays, we are concerned about the the uh, the uh, we are the, we are now talking about the citizen science concept. And actually, we have uh, from last thousands and more the, the uh, thousands and thousands of years old that uh, the concept actually the, the the local people or the neighbor neighboring people actually know about the surroundings about the wild habitat presence in the surrounding and the neighborhood and the species live in the surrounding so they have a deep understanding about that and finally uh, the finally the the concept of biophilia actually uh, invades in this case biophilia is that is the uh, the human love or human bond with the other species actually there is a sheer love uh, from the others. We always uh, feel uh, love with the other species, and it is not not uh, not uh, uh, not, uh, not uh, uh, gathered from a one generation. It actually gathered from generation after generation throughout the gene uh, culture coevolution. After that, we uh, this this love for the nature, this love for the wild species that uh, that actually. Uh, uh, that came out is uh, because of this kind of thing. So uh, uh, I can conclude with that. So I can conclude with that. There is a uh, the the there is a traditional management system that are that are actually uh, that are actually uh, occurred that are actually going on within the uh, within the village area uh, over uh, a thousands uh, thousands of years. And uh, uh, they are managing and maintaining the habitat for so long, uh, but never get acknowledged or recognized their process of management as any kind of, uh, by any kind of uh, formal uh, government or non-government agencies or any kind of individuals. But they are actually doing the same thing, conserving the species in a, some different way, not some, some directly, some indirect uh, attitude or indirect practice actually help them to uh, conserve these large range of species. So nowadays there's a paradigm, a huge paradigm shift that we can found uh, in a conservation philosophy, conservation of wildlife and the conservation philosophy. That is uh, uh, nowadays it's not possible. Most of the uh, scientists and the uh, philosopher and the conservation biologists uh, raise their voice that isolating of uh, common people from wildlife is not the way to conserve. Uh, to conserve uh, wildlife, the proper way to conserve wildlife, and uh, it's not uh, not the it's not uh, possible. It's not uh, right to focus only few charismatic vertebrates. Uh, there are there are most of the there are many other many other species actually uh, you can find 
uh, the, the the whole the, the entire country which actually needs conservation so there are there are huge paradigm shift that is from the isolating wildlife from the common people to uh, people's participation and uh, to promote the coexistence with wildlife the people's participation means the including the traditional knowledge and including the people itself to this conservation process and exert some uh, the the uh, cumulative outcome of the uh, the management strategy and not focusing on a few charismatic vertebrates a few charismatic animals within the protected areas but apart from the protected areas within the villages outside the protected areas within the urban areas there are a huge number of uh, wild biodiversity that inhabit there we also have to focus on them uh, for the betterment of our future so that's it my here i can conclude this is this are the uh, the uh, i can i want to acknowledge these people and there are different people with the photos for this uh, this uh, presentation i am not a good photographer that's why i have to hire a photo for different of our photographers so that's it thank you thank you so much sir for this very informative presentation so now we shall go for the discussion and question answer round kindly please write your questions in the chat box questions already questions okay sir i have one question hmm. okay ask can me. you go uh, like that slide in where it was written uh, after that love for animals there was written that uh, the anim uh, the reasons for conserving these animals what mm -hmm. uh, uh just well uh, one of the reasons was hello sir am i audible uh, 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 uh. yeah yes, yes, yes. just uh, uh, can you repeat just once this one no? i i'm sharing the screen this one there was written a uh, reason for conservation was yeah after this the graph after this one ah, yes okay yes. the graph uh, what is this consumption this one Okay. Huh. Yes. This what is this uh, consumption part? Because like Con consumption means uh, actually that I mentioned in the the uh, this slide, na that is the uh, it's a good source of protein diet. But uh, that, that is the consumption. Uh, that is like that is actually degrading the. Uh, isn't it like degrading the environment or uh, like how can this be a part of the conservation? Okay, okay. I, 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 I want to explain that. It's a good question. I want to explain that. So consumption. And uh, still, why... it is better because uh, non-timber forest product collection is there, but mm. why for animals? Ah, okay. Uh, the the thing is mostly same. Uh, this uh, the modern conservation techniques that we are using, actually, it's a hardly hundred years old. Okay. So and uh, the pe people are living with the animals from last thousands and more than thousands of years. The five thousand, six thousand years. Uh, the cultivate the uh, human gets settled uh, after uh, uh, invention of cultivation. It's uh, approximately ten thousand to twelve thousand years ago. And from that day to now, species uh, people are living with this animal and they are using this species as their consumption uh, for their consumption. But still, they are not degraded till now. Okay, they are they are good in number. So, first question is answer is that the consumption is not the sign of degradation because this consumption is also uh, uh, also practiced traditionally and in a sustainable matter. There are huge this this part can we can talk about uh, it's an hour and hour of discussion. Uh, but it's not at all a, a cause of. Uh, degradation of any animal because it's a part of the traditional process and number the number two part the, the second justification is uh, they 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 know that they 
uh, uh, rats uh, actually that's a good source of protein or squirrel is a good source of protein and they also know that if they wiped out if they eat all the species all the individuals their uh, upcoming generations will not uh, get to uh, eat or get a uh, uh, protein from these sources so they use as consumption purpose as their food but also in a sustainable way also they leave a certain kind of uh, uh, the a certain species or certain individuals apart from this activities so uh, th these are the actually main causes of uh, uh, the, the consumption not always uh, not always uh, anti or not always negative uh, for the conservation because it's a it's a tradition it's a long 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 process so there is a more more harmful things we, we do nowadays in last 100 years and the 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 you, you can you can if you show the, if, if you the, got the graph that the decline uh, the population decline uh, caused because of different other activities but not because of consumption because this consumption process is practiced from last 5000 6000 years last or the, the if not more it's want to say that the species they consume they are not under the uh, first and second uh, section of uh, wildlife protection no no, act. No, no, no 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 not at all i'm not saying that they also eat uh, monitor lizards they eat most of the monitor lizards and monitor lizards it is the, a, uh, monitor lizards. but still but still uh, uh, it, it is not uh, uh, it is not in a that there are there are few incidents which are now focused we are we are in the focus because of this social media activities but that is a glimpse that is obvious that is true that is not good i'm not supporting that but that is not the entire picture that is not the entire picture they if uh, they just uh, hunt only those uh, those amount of uh, food or those amount of protein uh, which actually necessary for them not not more than that obviously not more than that but there are definitely some ex exceptions and there are something uh, which are nowadays actually arise but uh, overall i can say that consumption is not at all the uh, the cause for this degradation of animals so it is not a cause of concern uh, rather we should take it as a natural predator prey model process exactly 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 the okay, concern yeah. the concern is that the concern is that uh that that there's some people who are actually not uh not so called tribals or not so called uh not so called uh, they don't need to hunt but still they hunt because of fun that is not right and that is also that is also happened in some places but that is not or also that is not the the entire the in, uh, the the entire situation the, the overall situation is not that that's a there's a we have to understand the difference between the poaching and uh, poaching for commercial purpose or and the the hunting for the food okay sir, sir uh, so, thank you sir for uh, my question is your so, okay. thank you for sir your uh, informative uh, presentation professor chatterjee sir sir my hmm. question is that ki whatever the introduce the concept of biophilia hmm. do you think today technology reshaping okay. the individual life to the global life the second thing yeah. how technology play a positive role or destructive role yeah. to disturb the biophilia uh, in coming future time no actually it's really really hard to say but my belief is that uh, this biophilia thing actually is not a overnight process no? it's a, it's also a uh, that some last uh, uh lacks of years of evolution through evolution that human get into it they they uh, evolve through this through lacks of years of evolution and the technology thing just uh, arrived our in our uh, societies uh, it's a thousand or 200 it's a, it's a hundred or 200 years old uh, the after the industrial revolution or the rail engine came uh, after that everything changed but uh, I, I it's my belief or uh, it's actually most of the the uh, biophilia specialists uh, uh, the wilson uh, the yo wilson and the professor gadgil everybody they also uh, 
also said that it's not possible to uh, wipe out the concept of biophilia uh, because of this technology. You, uh, at least uh, in in upcoming few hundred of years, because we achieve through this through after uh, uh, lakhs of years of uh, evolution. So it's not possible to uh, wipe out from our gene uh, the, through this uh, thousands of years, uh, through upcoming hundreds of years. Okay, so I uh, do have questions for uh, Dr. Sakti, you are there. I have a question for you. Okay, so uh, after this pandemic situation, uh, plastic waste will be more on the oceans and uh, the seas. So what is the future of marine uh, biodiversity conservation post uh, COVID-19? COVID-19. Uh, well, I'm trying to answer the question, yeah? Uh, regarding to the plastic in the ocean, uh, of course, Indonesia is uh, considered as the second polluter of the plastic in the marine environment after China. And we know we have uh, several actions in, in order to reduce the marine plastic debris uh, 70% 70 in 2025. So we have so, uh, a lot of action, uh, especially uh, working with the local community, the beach clean up, uh, and also the education for people. Uh, of course, for us as the academician and the scientists, we have to uh, getting the data regarding to the microplastic in the coastal area and also my, microplastic, my, microplastic. So uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, period, we have some uh, difficulty to conduct the, uh, uh, the field research, yeah? Uh, but uh, we still running uh, in the uh, in to educate the people through many action uh and more particularly using the webinar uh, i think the in the first uh, two months of the pandemic in indonesia uh, we make at least 10 webinar regarding the microplastic so uh, we are very concerned with this kind of the problem and i think so uh, but we can uh, hope that uh, uh, maybe uh, in the next period of time, uh, we hope that the pandemic will be end and we can go directly to the field to in order to uh, uh, make uh, another another uh, research, yeah, uh, to provide the, the good data for the good man management. So I think this is what uh, I can uh, answer for you. Thank you so much, sir. So, uh, my next question uh, is to Mahalaya, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, so, like, uh, in the current situation, we are uh, reading a lot about EIA, Environmental impact assessment act and uh, like a lot of conservationists are actually against it and some of it are like for it so what do you think ma'am uh, your views on the eia act now the uh, the present uh, what the eia act is trying to transform itself is definitely an attack on environmental conservation and environmental preservation uh, because uh, most of the uh, most of the uh, what should I say? Most of the parts of it's diluted for quicker disposal of cases. Uh, now that is not to be expected because environment is something which goes over time and space. So just to give quicker clearance to some of the projects, it is diluting parts of the existing act. 
no this is really really very uh, very bad uh, and i think the protests are quite logical quite logical and another part i would like to uh, if i have the chance i have like to say that is about public participation hmm. now one of the very strong points of our eia was public participation that every eia report has to be publicly placed firstly it was uh, advertised in newspapers and others that it is uh, visible in some place in dm's office or uh, pollution control board office or any public place and people have the chance to go over it and and give their comments over it then uh, came the so called uh, it age and it was available on the web and people could send their comments hmm. send their comments and others but this part is also very much diluted in the proposed draft of eia hmm. now eia is meant for conserving the environment protecting it ha ah, now if you just think in terms of in our first presentation our uh, revered ambassador he talked about uh, uh, this particular point very in a very emphasized way that uh, uh, that we cannot play with the environment we have to preserve it so uh, gdp is not the only point gdp is definitely important as i have said that economic stability is definitely very important but just for economic uh, uh, production and economic activity we cannot just do away with the environment so without looking into all the points without looking into the benchmark without looking into the effects of a particular project on the environment either from first studies or from some simulation exercises without proper uh, impact on the biophysical environment and also the social environment it is uh, to stay uh, very strongly that it is a criminal offense to dilute to dilute the existing iia ordinances thank you ma'am uh participants if you have any questions please write in the chat box din na kono time manage uh, ma'am uh, we have a question here like how can we involve more and more people in public participation about what you have just said because many are not at all aware like well known about it about eia uh in the last part of my talk i talked about uh, uh, talked about this particular thing awareness and public participation hmm. and for that of course we have to think of our governance structure uh, especially strengthening the local governments uh, local governments are so that so that people know that this is that uh, as i have said that there is no conflict between the local and the global the local and the global has to act together hmm. act together and in that sense if the local people are aware they will definitely come to it uh, they at the people uh, they are the uh, persons who understands that they have to preserve the local for their well being if we are able to create that awareness then public participation is automatically possible and if you think that uh, no it's not my concern it's big big things and to be managed by big big people uh, then it will not happen but if we can ingrain in every person that it's it's your environment then of course this will happen as uh, professor Ch in professor chatterjee's presentation we have seen how the local people the village people they go for local preservation in different forms sometimes in the name of religion sometimes in the name of society and we have seen it so it's there in our society uh, we have just uh, just make the people aware and if possible depoliticize the whole thing okay ma'am but uh, like i have read about if some protest like completely uh, politically neutral protests are also um, occurring about this act arrests hmm. are going on like several uh, conservation uh, websites have been uh, blocked so uh, like completely uh, what you can say 
taking away the um, freedom of speech of conservationists and uh, what is the solution now no unfortunately the, what is going on in our country i have to bring in politics that whenever you have any dissent voice for any reason it is being stopped hmm. it is being stopped and uh, again the, we live in a democratic country it's uh, there is right to dissent there is right to give your own uh, own uh, idea about anything huh? that is preserved by our constitution and it is our duty to protect our constitutional rights nobody will give it it is not something that this is gifted by something this is our constitutional right we have to uh, uh, preserve it we have to preserve it we have to stand for our rights uh, otherwise there's no go there is still however corrupt it is there is still a legal system if something is blocked if a website is blocked i haven't heard about put it but as you were saying uh, as the, if any website is blocked just for it is protesting against uh, a proposed act proposed act we have to stand for it and there is no way out there is no way out our, our government is elected for 5 years only but environment is forever our rights are forever right man uh okay ma'am there is another question like even if we are uh, voicing our rights in social media and other ways the posts are being deleted and profiles being reported the same Com thing the <laughs> same thing this somebody trying to somebody trying to stop you in some means or others and some means or other you have but uh, i have to bring in most of, most of current politics if i have to answer this question but the only thing is as i have said that environment is ever, for ever we have to preserve it we have to take different means uh, different means if social media is not uh, uh, is uh, stopped by any means or other we have to take legal means we have to use the other medias like uh, newspapers and others uh, one cannot stop everything and anything then we must be living in a country where there is no democratic right okay ma'am okay uh, so uh, like my question to all of the uh, panelists will be like what is the future of biodiversity or conservation uh, sorry biodiversity conservation as a discipline like uh, education career anything as a discipline uh, what is the future ma'am uh is it uh, directed to me or all of the panelists ma'am uh, first you answer and then i will be going to dr sept <clears throat> uh, uh i am not a person of bioscience but from my point of view as i have said that we take an anthropocentric view that what is good for human being is uh, has has to be preserved and what is not good for human being destroy it but that is not going to preserve the ecological balance we have to think of uh, biodiversity and we have to preserve it and if we talk about biodiversity then as uh, biodiversity as it uh, i should not say the discipline it is a fact it is a fact and we have to preserve that fact uh, we have to think about the variety of flora and fauna around us uh, we have to think of the ecosystems uh, uh, ecosystems small or big and we have to preserve them so there has to be a future otherwise there will be no future for human being okay so uh, the same question to you dr sakti well for me principally biological diversity or biodiversity is mean other diversity too so biological diversity is also chemical diversity for people who working with the uh, chemistry or the biochemistry and well, biodiversity is also a uh, uh, diversity in cultural diversity in social uh, economic uh, cultural society so uh, it's very fundamental when we talk about the biodiversity so we have to preserve and to uh, maintain the equilibrium 
uh, among the social, ecological, and also the uh, uh, political aspect. So we can live in the harmony uh, with the biodiversity as the main uh, main uh, what we call main aspect to be uh, to be very, uh, conserved. Okay, Dita. Yeah. My small comment to the uh, Chatterjee, ma'am. Ma'am, whatever you were saying that uh, the election is not the single determinant of democracy. We know that whatever the fundamentals of democracy, institution matters. Whatever the grantor of constitutions is matter. If we know that the whatever the, the dangerous experiment in democracy today, we all are thinking whatever the social media, ma'am, uh, all are under surveillance. Even Facebook is you're monitoring by the Facebooks, the, the, the officials, even, even Twitter, all are uh, handling by if if are putting some messages against the government or whatever the against the will of the some of the section of the society might be possible police approach you. So intuition is weakening, intuition matters. Matter is the ethics. So ma'am, uh, whatever we can say, uh, my, my uh, the point is here, intuition is matter in democracy, like the America, intuition is matter. Does not matter who is the president, who will be the president of America in Britain. But India, it is the leadership matters, institution not matters. So parliament democracy, institution matters. Their ethics is matter, their importance, their honesty, their whatever we say that the whatever the fundamental character decided by the constitutions. So the peoples have to write to their descents in democracy, but peoples are still searching which institution will grant her for your justice? Justice matter for the society. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I also believe, I also believe institutions matter, people's unity matters. Uh, 